thank you all for coming to this amazing workshop organized by GSSA really and, and CSIRO and thanks for the opportunity. Um, so this was a, a six month project just after my PhD that was sponsored by DGO Gold. Uh, so I didn't starve to death after I finished my PhD and it worked out really well. I had a really good time looking at the rocks in the Tapley Hill and everyone keeps talking about Kamoa Kukula today and I worked on that as well. Sadly, uh, I'm not allowed to present the data, uh, but so you just have to take my word on how similar some of the pyrite textures are in the Kamoa Kukula Kansoko and, and Tapley Hill. Uh, in 10 years' time, I'm sure I'll be allowed to present on that. So uh, thank you to Ed Eshoes. Prof, you'll know him as Ross Large, passed on his pyrite enthusiasm slash obsession onto me. Stu, Matt Cracknell, Barry, David, and Karen from here, who helped me with my sample collection a lot, as well as Dale and Ty, who had to put up with my ridiculous, mundane description of exactly where the core had to be cut so I could have my pyrite analysis. So I think we've had what, 10,000 introductions today, so I'm not going to take you through each and every bullet point, but please do focus on the ones in bold. Um, I think when it, having worked on pyrite chemistry for all sorts of things in the last six years, I think it's in my best interest to tell you that it's best not to be biased by deposit genesis style. You can get into this argument People get into, have careers out of it, and 10 years on, 20 years on, we still don't know if it's epigenetic or syngenetic, but we can argue for as long as we want, as long as it does not bias the way we look at any geochemical analysis, and that's something to keep in mind when we discuss pyrite analysis. So this was just a six-month project where we looked at the Tapley Hill formation, and I focused mainly on the base of the Tapley Hill Formation to look at the pyrite chemistry and see if it's telling us anything. In terms of chemistry, I mean the trace element concentration of some of the pyrite textures, and I targeted the ones that were present in all drill holes that I looked at. And ultimately, um, as with any exploration uh, project, you want to look for new targets, and that's why everyone is here. So we had a lot of legacy data because my colleagues Jeff Stedman and Dan Gregory worked on some of the drill holes uh, from the core shed here. But we, I added a, a few more to those um, drill hole lists. So we divided the, the corridor into Olympic, Emmy, Mount Gunson, North Mile, and Mile Creek. Don't worry, I won't go through all of them. I only have 15 minutes. But I'll just give you the, the gist of what we can do with pyrite chemistry in these reduced facies that we've been talking about from the Tapley Hill Formation. So here's uh, the list of the, the drill holes, well not list, the location of the drill holes that I, I focused on. So the method really was to collect the most organic matter-rich shales because that gives you a good, idea, a good idea about what the different types of pyrite textures may be. And you can, and something that I've noted from my Kamoa Kukula Kansoko study was that you can mimic the pyrite trace element trends with the whole rock trace element trends, but in, in a lot of cases you can't because you've got so many different pyrite textures that when you crush the rock, you don't actually tap every single signature. You end up having a mixed result and it gives you the impression that nothing's going on, but that, that's not true. And so it's best to collect what I had in mind was to look at uh, the most organic matter-rich intervals because that gives you a, the variety of pyrite textures and then having, I'll show you those textures in a minute, but once you look at all the textures and, and see what they represent, you can then target and see where your pathfinder elements are and in which texture type. And so, yeah, lots of, um, lots of uh, sample collection weeks just here in, in Tonsley in 2018 and, and probably a bit in 2019 as well. We analyze five to 10 mounts per drill hole and 10 to 15 pyrite grains. If you're wondering if that's enough, I'm going to say yes it is. I've just finished uh, an industry project that was uh, GSSA was a sponsor in and that was another question that was asked, is 10 analyses enough from a single pyrite mount? And I would say yes, because 
We've analyzed 10 grains and we've analyzed 50 grains and it gives you the same result. Again, take my word for it. So we've analyzed lots of pyrats, as you can see, around 1400 analyses. And you get data of about 20 trace elements and lead isotopes. And I, I think Adrian mentioned that in his talk. They're really um, useful. There are, there's a conventional way of doing lead isotopes from whole rock, but again, I would really um, encourage you to test, if you haven't, the, the power of in-situ uh, analysis. They can reveal a lot more than whole rock can. And like I said, while some trends are replicable, some aren't, and maybe we are missing out on, on a lot of information because of that. Um, Thomas has had his chance of bragging about his textures. He is mine. Um, so lots of different types of textures, and I can, I wish I could show you, but the textures that I observe in the Tapley Hill Formation, some of them are exactly similar to what I've seen in, in Kamoa and, and Kakula. So again, a bullet point for, for later on when you're going through my presentation, but here are some of the, from some of the textures. So really fine-grained pyrite in dolomitic black shales, very typical. I've looked at hundreds of, or probably thousands of these black shell mounts over the course of my PhD and postdoc, which is quite similar. In the bottom, you're seeing um, some framboids that are overgrown by, by later recrystallized pyrites. Again, some beautiful pyrite at all textures. If you want to know how they form, I'm more than happy to discuss that later. But like I said, there's a great diversity of pyrite textures in these rocks. Um, again, it's probably not showing that well here, but you can see the, is, can you see the point? Oh, no, you can't. So these bits here are chalcopyrite, and I've got a better photo for you. Again, there's a pyrite framboid rimmed by, by chalcopyrite, and, and a, a lot of the mechanisms why these textures form are not necessarily uh, diagenetic. They can be very uh, syngenetic in nature. So it's a huge debate about how these textures form, and that may also inform us how the deposits form in, in general. There actually might be a mixture of um, processes that form these sediment-hosted deposits. And the other thing where I, I, I've noticed, whether it's sedex zinc lead or sed copper, quite often the framboidal pyrite or, or the fine-grained pyrite, oh, that's pre or let's not worry about it. Uh, but have a look at this, and again, I'm probably not allowed to show this. It's just come out of our industry project, and it's still com confidential, but again, uh, you can only take so much for my word. So here's an example of how the frame bottle pyrite is enriched in copper compared to, to the um, outside recrystallized material. More textures, coarse-grained pyrite infills. Um, then you've got chalcopyrite and pyrite co-associated with one another. And then, of course, you've got the, the copper sulfides, uh, something that everyone's interested in. So because you see that great diversity of textures, they all have their signature trace element content. So analyzing whole rock just does not make much sense to me when, when you're actually trying to nail down and use it as an exploration vector. You have to target specific textures and see if the content of the pyrite has anything to do with um, mineralization vector. So I targeted textures that were present in, in all drill holes, and they were the fine grain sedimentary to frame bottle pyrites. Uh, where it was possible, I also analyzed the different variety of textures, but because they weren't present in all the drill holes, you couldn't get much meaning out of it. But what we did end up doing, and uh, this is not to scare you or anything, or make you squint, I'll, I'll go, go through this one by one, but you can set a series of um, criterions just to see whether you can use the different elements and their association in these analyses to make sense out of it. And if it does, then can you then have um, a matrix scoring system for each drill hole where you go, all right, well, what are the element association? What are the ratios like? What about factors? What about lead isotopes and its association with silver? So these are the best element associations that we could find in pyrite, and it's worked out really well. So just going through each criterion, so we have element plots. Here I'm showing you plots of arsenic, copper, silver, and lead. And the proximal holes are behaving exactly how they should. And then 
also I should mention that this sort of study also helps you nailing what background is. Um, I know we're all interested in awe, but sometimes it's a really good idea to nail what, what background is so you don't waste your time. It's very important to have that as a, as a reference point. And so, yeah, there's a, there's a clear way of discriminating what's close to an ore body and what's not based on the chemistry of the pyrite, the trace element chemistry. Obviously, not all elements are going to be useful, but some are incredibly useful. Uh, whilst uh, biplots are useful, you could also use ratios. We've used ratios of cobalt and nickel, thallium and, and selenium, and quite often these ratios are based on the fact that sometimes you see an element increase as you go towards an ore body, which makes perfect sense, but also you see elements that decrease as you move towards an ore body, and so one, when you see these antithetic relationships, you can be more confident that you are indeed seeing uh, a trend, and that's something I've noticed in the African side of things as well that while some elements increase, others decrease as well. And then you've got um, factors. Now you can standardize the data and calculate Z scores and, and have look at uh, a suite of elements, or you can uh, calculate uh, factors for each drill hole separately and see what it's doing. And again, uh, they're, they're just another way of, of discriminating the data between what's uh, interesting and what's not. Um, lead isotope is, again, very, very useful. It's part of the routine analysis. You're not going to have to do lead isotope analysis separately. Um, it comes as, as part of the data package, and we use the 207, 206 ratios, and in this case, it, it's worked really well. Um, uh, apologies for not putting silver here, but it's silver on the x-axis over there. Um, and yeah, again, a good way of discriminating of what's close to an ore body and, and what's not. And this particular drill hole, you can actually see that uh, element association, that where you see an increase in silver, you see a decrease um, to that target signature. So every Mount Gunson, uh, Mile Creek, Amy Bluff, they all have a distinct lead isotope signature. And you know when the sample or the, or the rock has been influenced by the mineralizing fluid because it will affect your lead isotope signatures. So coming back, um, you can use these element associations and then devise a, a scoring matrix, which, which I did. And I'm just going to show you that for Mile Creek, you probably know all about Mile Creek. You probably know more about Mile Creek than me. Um, so these are the list of drill holes that I looked for Mile Creek, but others as well. So if you're interested later on, happy to go through them. So it worked really well with uh, the Mile Creek zone where the proximal holes behaved exactly how they should have and the ones that were not really interesting. One of them is actually laid out in the core shed, uh, Pub 22. And so if we were to go through um, the ratios, this is what it would look like again. Really good um, data sets that you are able to then um, use these plots for, for your own purpose. Uh, similarly for factors, I haven't shown you the one where I calculated Z scores. This is the one where we calculated factors for each drill hole. And yeah, it's uh, essentially showing the same pattern as we saw for the other two criteria. And going back to the to the lead isotope signature, you know when um, you see the 0 0.75 target signature, you know it's been affected by the mineralizing fluid, and it, it it's represented by the pyrite lead isotope uh, ratios very well. And so you can see that for Mile Creek very clearly in these plots here. So if we were to score, um, this is what it would look like, and I'd like to draw your attention to. Pub 22, that's been laid out downstairs for you. I know it didn't look very happening, did it from from her, but so that's that's another thing. It might not look all uh, shiny and whatever it is that you're expecting, but look at the chemistry and yeah, it's it's it looks interesting suddenly. And so, as as Prof would say, we've found the silver bullet in uh, in the sense that you could use the the chemistry of pyrite to to A, understand what's going on with uh, trace element distribution in and around the deposit. And at the end of this study, we, we did identify two target areas. And, and so, yeah, more drilling will obviously shed more light onto it. But um, 
but yeah, let's uh, hopefully I'll be able to show some comparison mm -hmm. between the African side of things, the pyrite chemistry and, and Stuart shelf, but they, they're quite similar in, in many ways. So yeah, we might find uh, Kamoak soon. Thank you.